Hey everyone! Before we begin this week's episode, we have a few things we'd like to say. We received an email this week from listener Paige with some important corrections that we wanted to share. First, even though we looked it up, we still pronounced Jennifer Ely's name wrong. Fair warning, we pre-recorded all of the episodes covering the 95 version, so we're going to say eel every time. Apologies in advance, it's Ely, not eel. No disrespect to our girl Jennifer. Second, We also called this version the BBC Masterpiece version and will continue to do so for the next 10 episodes. However, this is not the BBC Masterpiece version. Masterpiece Theatre presented Pride and Prejudice in 1980, so when the BBC produced another miniseries in 95, Masterpiece passed on it. Instead, it was presented on the American side by A&E Networks and as its own entity on the BBC. I know that's all very confusing. We were confused too, which is why you've heard and will continue to hear us refer to it as the BBC Masterpiece version. Thanks, Paige, for pointing this out. And lastly, we'd just like to plug our Patreon page once more. For the price of, like, half a cup of coffee in New York, you can get access to our notes, screenshots of our group chat, bonus episodes, and outtakes. Check us out at patreon.com slash podandprejudice to learn more. And now, enjoy this week's episode, covering the first half of episode two of the 1995 Pride and Prejudice miniseries, guest starring Evan Tess Murray. Yeah, it's definitely true that Molly has a lot of typos in the notes, and nine times out of ten I can tell exactly what Molly is talking about, but every so often you make a typo and I'm like, what? My favorite one that I've done so far is where I spelled Caroline kind of like, um, what's his face's child, where it's like (laughs) X-A-E (laughs) hyphen 12. And that's how I spelled Caroline Bingley. It was like... Elon Musk's precursor is Caroline Bingley. Actually, honestly, Caroline Bingley would a 10 out of 10 marry Elon Musk. Oh my God. Yes. This is Becca. This is Molly. We're here to talk about Jane Austen. We are here to talk about Jane Austen. And we have with us today our second ever guest. And it's very exciting. We have Evan Tess Murray with us today. Welcome, Evan. (laughs) Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Do you want to give yourself a little intro and let our listeners know where they may have heard your voice before? Sure. I actually lend my voice to a lot of projects, like a tiny bit at a time. So if you think you've heard me in an audio drama, you might be right. My show that I create is This Planet Needs a Name. It's a science fiction, hope punk audio drama that I write and act in. Uh, And I have another one that I co-create with a couple of friends called Light Hearts, which is a... Uh, again with the hope punk apparently I just do hope but it's a uh, it's a queer sitcom set in a haunted gay bar a haunted gay bar oh that's incredible yes there's a lot of ghostly hijinks and absolutely no stakes oh, fuck every yeah. single episode every potential conflict is resolved by the end of the episode we love that we really need that in our lives right now <laughs> yes that's why we started it so uh that's light hearts which is just about to release its second episode and it's just a an absolute blast to do so those are the two shows that i sort of write and direct on in general i just enjoy doing enjoy doing audio i enjoy doing interviews all of this so and I've been a Pod and Prejudice fan since fairly early on, actually. Yeah, yes. one of the OGs. Well, uh, welcome to our little corner of the podcast world. We're so excited to have you. And as you are a guest on this show, it's very important that we let our listeners know how you interact with Jane Austen, how you came to Jane Austen, and then what character in Jane Austen that you identify with. But now, if you haven't read Jane Austen that can be who you identify with based on our takes on Jane Austen Mm. so I started reading Jane Austen far too young to understand what any of it meant I read a lot of so in my childhood I read my way through all the libraries and then my parents would like get discarded books and stuff so I read all this Edwardian and Victorian children's literature as well uh, when I was like 10 and 11 and I was also reading Austen at that point And I didn't understand any of it. I didn't understand why you would wear gloves at tea time or what tea time was or why you would be very worried that mama would be very wroth with you for getting your gloves dirty. None of that made any sense to me at 11. But it does mean that the language of Jane Austen is like embedded in me. Uh, My vocabulary is bizarre. And every time you stop the podcast and you're like, we looked up this word, I'm like, but why? That is a normal word in common parlance. And then I'm like, wait, common parlance isn't in common parlance. (laughs) What am I doing? <laughs> so I've, I love Austin in general. The language works for me. I love her 
wit and uh, just every a lot of what she's doing in her books I absolutely adore characters so in this one I really hate to admit it but I'm just like straight up Fitzwilliam Darcy like he is too sincere <laughs> all the time he cannot stop being too sincere and honest and honorable and he just can't help himself and he can make I, I'm better at small talk now, but I used to be terrible at it. And so the whole, like, I have said my one small talk and now I will flee because you're pretty is, like, my life. That is my life. <laughs> so Listen, we, we stand our little disaster human Fitzwilliam Darcy, so we have no choice but to stand Evan if you are also a human I disaster. <laughs> just connect so hard with the, like, I'm real sorry, but I don't know how to lie. He's so sorry sweet in this episode when he when he's like I wish he would not try to parse out my personality right now because uh, it's not gonna be great for either of us <laughs> yeah and then he just walks away but we'll get there we will we will get there so uh last question before we jump into episode two of the 1995 Pride and Prejudice do you have any Austin hot takes to give oh I at this point do not I'm sorry I think I'm genuinely something resembling an Austin Stan. Like I definitely, there's a lot of stuff going on there that, you know, but it just, when you see, you look at her position in the world and what she was trying to do, I just fucking love her. That's all. We, we also do. Yeah, we do. And that is why we, we do the podcast. So we start out with Elizabeth Bennett walking through the fields, looking up very thoughtfully at a pack of, or a pack, a <laughs> flock. Flock. A flock? flock is usually the word. <laughs> a flock <laughs> at a flock of birds. And I guess that's supposed to symbolize like the changing of the seasons. I don't know. But anyway, jumps right into scene one. And this is where we find out that a guest is coming to Longbourn. And Mrs. Bennett automatically assumes it's Bingley and she's like squealing and she's so excited in typical Mrs. Bennett fashion. And Lydia and Kitty are giggling about like, oh, will it be an officer? Which doesn't make sense because he just said it's someone he's never met. Mm. Well, Daddy Bennett's pretty antisocial, so it's possible he like hasn't been going to the events where the officers are. That's true. But when they're squealing about this, Mr. Bennett does a single blink like you know when someone's looking at you and you're saying something that they're annoyed by and they just go like blink blink mm -hmm. he just blinks once and they shut up and sit down and listen to what he has to say and it's phenomenal and this is where we find out it is mr collins uh. <laughs> <laughs> that is the correct sound effect for mr collins one of the things that isn't like i don't know if you remember this from like the book part when we first got introduced to Mr. Collins, but you, the way he's described in the book is almost endearing. Like you're like, oh, he doesn't like know how to interact with people. But the moment Mr. Collins hits the story here, you're just like, oh no. Yes. <laughs> Correct. He is grody. So they do this nice little fade in from Mr. Bennett reading the letter that from Collins to Mr. Collins reading the letter from Collins. And he is greasy i was watching this with uh my boyfriend who does not read pride and prejudice and he was looking at the screen and he just goes that man is the human personification of sweat <laughs> and i was like i'm really angry that i wasn't the person who thought of that first i was watching it with somebody who hasn't read the book or watched anything about it but has like seen a lot of gift sets on tumblr and we got to the end of the letter and she just looked at me and I said, oh, no, no, he really is that bad. <laughs> <laughs> he really is. And we see him like talking about Catherine de Berg and we watch him interact with Catherine de Berg a little. And he literally shoves someone out of the way so she can get out of the church. Do you notice how he says Catherine de Berg? Catherine de Berg. Evan, can you give us a little Catherine de Berg? Catherine de Berg. Oh, he that is like incredible. <laughs> he's talking about how he's going to get from his residence to Longbourn, which I think they added from the letter in the book. If I'm not mistaken, he didn't describe like the bus system uh, where he was like, I'm going to catch this carriage at this time and then be to you by whatever. But while he's talking about the carriages, he gets in and the carriage takes off and he falls over because he has no <laughs> sense of stability in life, I guess. Nope. <laughs> None. <laughs> doop, doop, doop. So he arrives. And this is the main thing that I need to take away from what this film has done 
is that whenever he talks or does anything, Mary swoons. They like latched on to that yes. and ran with it. Oh my gosh. Yes. So first of all, this is a damage to our whole plot of Mary is a gay out of place. Yeah, unfortunate. Which sucks. But at the same time, if Mr. Collins were to be paired with any of the Bennett girls, it obviously makes sense that he would be with Mary. Yeah. They both love the Bible. They both have no social skills. And they both are introverts. So, like, I feel like they would be good together. And Mary agrees. And you can just see her little, like, heart a flutter every time he walks by. Yeah. Yeah, this version of Mary, yeah, they went, like, all in on the, look, he's overlooking the actual perfect match. Yeah, and she also, she, like, checks her hair when he gets out of the car. I mean. The carriage. Sorry. The car. (laughs) So then we go to dinner that night, and Mr. Bennett asks him to just talk about Lady Catherine de Bourgh, and he does this whole... I remember in the book they described him as, like, being very formal and kind of reverent and stuff when he talks about her, and he is like, Catherine de Bourgh. Oh, yes, and her beautiful daughter. And it's gross. (laughs) Lizzie is such a mood in the scene. This is the end of scene one, so we have a few study questions. And the first is, in the book, we only really get to see how Lizzie and the ethereal narrator are acting, are reacting to Mr. Collins and Mr. Bennett as well. But here you actually get like a little take on each Bennett sister in their first interaction with Mr. Collins. So I wonder if you could do the little rundown of how each Bennett is reacting to Collins. Well, Lizzie has a napkin in front of her face and can't stop laughing, which was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Mary was obviously, like, enraptured by him, hanging on his every word. I believe the adjective you're looking for is thirsty. Oh, sorry, (laughs) yes, Mary is thirsty. And Lydia keeps, like, snorting. Yeah, she doesn't hide it at all. No, she's so rude. Jane is trying to be chill, She's, like, giving little smirks and things, but she is the most polite one, probably, and Kitty, I don't think, does anything. Does she? Kitty's just sick. I also think, like, you see Jane being a little bit more disdainful of him than you see in the book, which I love for her. You see her smirk and make eye contact with Lizzie whenever he talks, and she's being polite about it, but she's, like, clearly on board with yikes as a concept for Mr. Collin. You guys know what I mean? Yeah, it's nice to see Jane not just being, like, nice and kind and perfectly understanding about everyone, but being like, listen, I'm not going to be mean to the guy, but do you hear him? (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, because in the book, I did kind of get bored of Jane Mm -hmm. in general. I was like, she's just good with quotation marks around it. Like, she's just a good person, but I think they definitely give her a bit more of a personality in the film version. Absolutely. Lizzie has to have somebody to make like eye contact with so that they can both smirk. Jane gets to do a lot more of that. Yeah. And she also does it with Mr. Bennett, mm. which I liked, as I always do. And Mr. Bennett has his glasses like falling off the tip of his nose. He's looking down them so hard. Yeah. So question number two, is there any difference between how Collins operates in the first part of the book when he comes in and how he's operating in the first part of this movie version when he comes in? He's definitely grosser. Like, when I was reading the book, I was picturing Kenneth Branagh because he... I was mostly picturing Gilderoy Lockhart because Mm -hmm. he's so over the top. But I was picturing him at least being, like, handsome. I think that what the movie's doing very clearly is it's automatically... I mean, I guess they did this in the book, too, but it's very automatically he's looking for a wife here. My idea of him actually matches this movie version reasonably well, although I kind of always imagined him as like kind of a a sweeter, more bumbling, like bumbling, socially inept, but with good intentions and a little less like obsequious. Although it is pretty I mean, he he name drops Catherine de Bourgh just as much in the book. So uh, it's not like that's an addition, but like my version of him in the that I imagine from the book is somewhat more likable. This one is just, he just, I. Uh. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly that. Because in this, he's like, it almost seems malicious. And I know that it's not, but it 
Well, we'll get to his proposal, but it seems malicious. And not just that he doesn't understand. Like, he kind of understands. It's like peak negging. I actually wrote down, oh my god, I didn't realize Austin invented negging. (laughs) Austin invented negging. Yes! She did. So, I also think the one thing I'd point out is that in the books, there's a little bit more that happens at, like, Netherfield before this part of the story and Collins comes in to sort of create a new piece of the drama but I think here he does something extra he throws into the Bennett household someone who makes the rest of the Bennett's look good (laughs) yes that's so true so the first episode like Mrs. Bennett is borderline unwatchable and here she like you can hear her voice drop and you can hear her say like normal things and that is only in comparison to Mr. Collins. Yes, because also when, when they talk about him arriving, she says, oh, please don't talk of that odious man. And I'm like, you're calling him odious. But then, yeah, she like almost seems sensible. How many times can you talk about a fireplace before people are just like, do you have to? Do you have to? I wrote that down. He literally brings it up twice in two scenes right next to each other. I know, it's terrible. We know, it's 800 pounds. It must be very large. We know. So scene two, uh, let, let's get into scene two, I guess. Yeah. So now we're outside and we are getting a little look at all of the Bennett girls doing their thing. And Kitia is playing horseshoes. And quites. I loved this. What? It's quites. It's what? Quoits. Q-U-O-I-T-S. Oh, it's a that? game where you throw rings of things. I told you I read these way too young. <laughs> <laughs> I recognized the game. Anyway, I keep going. Wait, that's amazing. Is it the same as cor- horseshoes except... More or less, it's different? rings. You throw rings at things. It's it's a little more ladylike, I think, was the idea. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, we love those good, good gendered games. We love that trivia. I was, I was never going to pick up on that. I just was like delighted. I'm like, oh my God, I know that game because I read these books and I have a weird vocabulary. Amazing. Well, they think it's the funniest shit they've ever done in their lives. They're laughing after they throw every single ring, which is clearly just like supposed to be a montage of us seeing what they're doing. But it was pretty funny. Jane and Lizzie are laughing and talking about I don't know what. And then Mary is standing there reading and Collins and Mrs. Bennett are on a walk. And he says that he thinks that Jane is hot. And she says, oh, Jane is going to be engaged soon. But my other daughters now, they're no no prior engagement on their part. And then the camera just does a little like bachelor numbers one, two, three, and four Mm -hmm. for Mr. Collins. And he's like, nope, nope, nope. And Mary is like reading and she looks so disinterested and then he lands on Lizzie and then Lydia and Kitty are like oh we're gonna go to Maryton and Mrs. Bennett is like Collins you should go with them and he's like oh yes and Lydia is like Ugh, out loud <laughs> because she's the worst <laughs> and the best I love her so much and then he asks Lizzie to walk with him we pan to them walking to Maryton and we hear <sighs> as he walks because it's Mr. Collins. They really make the experience of walking with Mr. Collins a, like, full body experience. You can hear him. You can see him. You can almost smell him. Mm-hmm. The embodiment of sweat. Yeah. It's really true. I was really taken with how Lizzie is acting while Mr. Collins is talking with her. And I remember describing when we were reading the book the face that a person makes when a man is talking to them in a specific way and your just eyes have to bug and you just go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And she is making that face the entire walk. She's just going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This Lizzie's facial expressions are prime the whole way through. Jennifer Eel is uh, hot. A- <laughs> Sorry, I just objectify her so hard. I love her. It's okay. She also has permanent resting, not bitch face, but resting um, done with the patriarchy face. Yeah, or resting I am secretly judging you face. Like, it's right yeah. there. Yes. It's right there. Yeah, right behind the eyes. Yeah. Kitty is wearing matching outfits. They look like Little Red Riding Hood. Yes, they do. They also match the regimentals. Mm. Oh. Yeah. It's okay. a very smart costuming choice to put Kitty in the, the bright colors next to the red coats. Mm. Mm-hmm. So they get into Maryton and Kitty sees a hat in a window and she's like, Lydia, I want this hat. Don't you think I would look good? And Lydia's like, not as good as me. Let's go find Denny. And she turns and she sees 
Denny with someone else who is not wearing a uniform. And they're all like, oh, who's that man with Denny? And they're like, oh, he's frightful handsome, isn't he? And Lydia says, not as handsome as he would be in regimentals. And it's interesting that they have Lydia noticing this man here and thinking that she doesn't yep. think he's anything without regimentals. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> Lydia calls them over in her cute little voice and Denny introduces them all and he ends by introducing Lydia and I took note of the way that he says Miss Lydia Bennett because it says so much about how she is viewed by the officers and also how she presents herself. She is Miss Lydia Bennett. Yeah, I think the thing the film does really well from the get-go that the book saves for later is establishing Lydia's reputation in the town. Yeah. Almost immediately, you're like, oh, this girl is known as the flirt. She's the easy easy rider. Yeah, and I, and I don't hate it. I think that I know that she's supposed to be annoying and everything, but I just, looking at her in this episode particularly, I've noticed, is that she just seems very fun and very carefree and I feel, and she's 15, and I remember being 15 and feeling like flirting with boys. This is funny because now I don't flirt with boys, but (laughs) when I was 15, I would flirt with boys, and it was like the most fun thing to be like that girl, you know? Oh, yeah, definitely. I also think that in the books, it's just one of those things where you feel it from Lizzie's perspective and how it's ruining her life. But in the film, when you see it, you're like, oh, this isn't that bad. She's just like... Having a good time. She's just like a stupid teenage girl. Yeah. It really emphasized for me... Well, and also they pulled more stuff out for Kitty. Yeah. Like, Kitty got to talk and and she's just not Lydia and they they seem slightly different, uh, which is nice. But also, it really drove home for me, like, she's a pretty normal 15-year-old girl who should probably have a parent telling her not to do this. Right, and she doesn't. And she does not. And so it's very, it kind of takes some of that, like, onus off of her. She's a kid. And I really like that compared to, like, Elizabeth always being annoyed with her for the choices she's making. Yeah, and I think also the officers are just normal 20-somethings. Although, I don't know how old Wickham is. I forget. He's, like, 28, He's Darcy's age, so, like. He's gross. But yeah, we're not gross. at him being gross. But yet. I think <laughs> I think Denny and the other young one, I can't remember. I think they're kids. I don't know, but they yeah. I think they are not a lot older. So it's like they're just flirting, having a good time. Yeah, this is basically like just normal teenage shenanigans. It's just they're in the context of Austin, they have different stakes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Which brings us to Mr. George Wickham. Yeah, so uh, uh, he introduces Wickham. <laughs> yeah, he pinches the brow of our noses. Um, <laughs> he is not that hot. Yeah, this is a genuine problem that I have with the Pride and Prejudice adaptations all across the board, except with a notable exception that we will get to later, and I will I will talk about it when it happens, but know that the general norm when we adapt Pride and Prejudice, is that they always make Wickham less hot than Darcy. And I'm like, that is not canon. Not canon. <laughs> I think this actor is quite handsome. No, don't get me wrong, but Colin Firth is so hot. And part of the point of the story is that Wickham is this dashing, extremely handsome, charming guy that gets away with absolutely everything because he's a beautiful person. Right. Not Like physically, not not emotionally. Emotionally, not emotionally. He's, he's a garbage fire. But it's one of those things where it's like... Lizzie is entranced and fooled by a hot guy. (laughs) Yeah, but what this guy does have going for him is his voice. Oh. Mm. He's got a really good speaking voice. Oh, yeah. And really kind of kind eyes that make it easy to listen to him say things. He's very much a con man. Instead of being the hot guy, he's the like, he's a confidence man. You trust him. He's soft. He comes across as gentle. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, I don't want, they invite him to Mrs. Phillips' house. And he's like, well, if Mrs. Phillips invited me, then I'll definitely come. But I don't have an invitation yet. And he's just like soothing and he seems humble and all of that. And that is huge for Wickham as a character as well. 
So, like, it's not just that he's hot. Yeah. So, yeah, there was that. And then Bingley and Darcy appear. And I was very disappointed to see that they were riding on two separate horses. Mm, I know. I, I, I literally wrote that down, too. I was like, oh, sorry. Sorry, Molly. Me, too. Because <laughs> my, my canon is that they're on one horse, but it's okay. This was interesting. The whole conversation happens between Bingley and Jane, and Lizzie is watching Wickham and Darcy, and what the movie changed from the book was that Wickham tips his hat, like, acknowledges Darcy's presence, and Darcy turned away and walked away on his horse. Or his horse walked away. I suppose he was sitting. But (laughs) that was different. That sends a very clear message that I think Lizzie was right to assume that Wickham was trying to be kind and Darcy was being a dick when in reality Wickham is a conniving, I don't know. SOB. Yeah. Mm. So I think that was smart. It was interesting. Absolutely. So that actually brings us to the end of this scene and the study questions I have are twofold. And we'll start with the first one just because we're on the subject anyway, which is the Darcy and Wickham drama plays as much more obvious here. And I think it has to be because like, You're getting Lizzie's perception of a very tiny interaction. But here you see Darcy openly snub Wickham. It's kind of like in the Harry Potter movies when they added Barty Crouch Jr. as like a character because otherwise there would be no way for the audience to get that. (laughs) Is that a way stretch? No, I get what you're saying. It's Sometimes in books things happen in characters' heads and history is like sort of given by an ethereal narrator. And when you're putting it onto film, you need to be a little bit more obvious about it. The thing I think about is The Handmaid's Tale. Have you guys Mm. ever watched that? No. Because most of it takes place inside of Offred's head. It's a much darker book in terms of literature than anything Jane Austen has ever written. (laughs) But the book has a lot of like what Offred is thinking about the Gilead society in her own head, but she can't say it loud or she'll die. But she actually has to say it out loud on the TV show because otherwise the audience doesn't get it. It's like... When they made The Giver into a movie. I I didn't read The Giver. Oh, never mind. I was going to say, it's like when they made Coraline into a movie and they had to invent YB out of whole cloth because otherwise the whole book is just one 12-year-old girl by herself having experiences and she would have no reason to talk out loud or say anything. Whoa. Exactly. I didn't know that Coraline was a book. Oh, yes, it's a book. I should read that. It's by Neil Gaiman. Whoa. Oh. A true icon and a legend. The other thing I had is um, we're seeing the flirtations actually happen. How does Colin's flirtation with Lizzie form how we think of Colin's and Lizzie? Because we just get that he's talking a lot in the book. It just says, like, Collins talks a lot, but you actually see him talking here. Yeah, I guess as, as opposed to talking into the ether, he's talking to Lizzie, and she is not really receiving. It kind of underlines the fact that he is so bad at reading what other people like he talks she doesn't want to hear it and he never notices she's like mm-hmm, 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 and she's not saying anything but and he does the whole i am very good at fitting in everywhere and i've made an art of it like all of that and like no you're terrible she can't tell you that and you still aren't seeing it and it's half oblivious but also half just like disrespect Respectful is how it reads to me. Like, you are not interested in other people's experiences, are you? Oh, definitely not. Not at all. And we'll definitely get into that with the proposal because that was worse than anything I could have ever imagined. Oh, yes. Yeah. So that brings us to scene three. At the Phillipses. At the Phillipses. Before we get into anything, what do you think of how Mrs. Phillips is characterized here? So I pictured her as being kind of dumb. And I think that they, like, tried to do that. But I actually really liked her. Because she seemed a little bit sarcastic. Like, we get to see her and Collins talking and him talking about how her home reminds him of a small summer breakfast room at Rosings. And she's really offended. And Jane is like, no, no. Rosings is very grand. And she says, oh, I understand. But I read it as sarcastic. I don't know if that's what they were intending. No, for real. She was like, of course, now I could not possibly be offended. Like, yeah. it was a, you idiot, you poor fool. Yeah. Fine. Everyone's just like clenching a jaw around Mr. Collins. Yeah. Yeah, she asks him to play whist with her and then she yells at him because he can't play very well. He's like doing the wrong thing. And she's like, Collins, hearts are trump cards. And he's like, Oh. <laughs> I think she only asked him to play whist to get him to stop talking. 
And then she got stuck Absolutely. playing whist with him. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. There's just no way to interact with Mr. Collins to make it at all enjoyable for yourself unless you are taking the Mr. Bennett approach and mocking him in a way that he does not understand. Which is A++. Amazing. Best use of Daddy Bennett's ability to uh, annihilate people. Yeah. So the other thing is that my boyfriend had one more hot take that I feel I very much needed to share, which is he was like, are Wickham and Denny fucking... Like, they're staying in the same quarters together, and they're, like, hanging out all the time. They they fuck it. I love that hot take because, I mean, while I think that Denny can definitely do better, and he does exude a kind of straight energy, he also, when they were talking about how Wickham was joining the military, he was, like, saying how Wickham was going to look so good in his regimentals, and he was, like, out swagger us all, eh, Wickham? Winky, winky. I could 100% get behind bisexual Denny, gay Wickham, and the whole reason Wickham has done what he has done is that he does not actually care about women at all and just sees them as a means to an end. I would be into the stake. Wait, that is a take, because he is trying to marry up yeah. so hard that he would marry a woman he does not have any feelings for and keep doing Denny on the side. I mean, I do hate saying like maybe he's an evil gay because like we have plenty of those but also maybe he's an evil gay maybe he's an evil gay and denny is a very harmless bisexual yes i love denny 100 percent. listeners uh let us know what you think of the idea that denny and wickham are getting up to their own sort of flirtations on the side oh i like that thanks mike yes so then we go back to um Lizzie and Wickham making the eyes at each other. Yeah, the whole like flirtation thing is portrayed in the films through us seeing people stare at each other across the room. Oh, yeah. Which is happening here. And which is also how Darcy flirts in general, but we're not there yet. I was having a lot of like lesbian culture moments like, oh, there's a lot of staring at each other and then thinking that you know what that means. Right. (laughs) It's like, are you flirting with me or are you being my friend? I don't I can't tell. (laughs) <laughs> well, it's our third coffee date. Are we dating? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's it, for me, it's usually the answer is no. But for the other person, it's often yes. And then I'm, <laughs> I, this is why I don't date because I'm bad at the thing. <laughs> I mean, but same. Yeah. So they're making eyes and Wickham comes to sit by Lizzie and he is like, I thought I would never escape your younger sisters. And she's like, yes, Lydia is very determined. And then we see Lydia like playing cards and being flirty as one is wont to do at a cards party, I suppose. And he says that they're very nice girls and he's generally pleased with the society in this part of the country and says it all in a very soothing voice. Yes. Oh, yes. And I also wanted to comment here, like this was just a mini study question snuck in. They really change how Lydia and Wickham meet to start. They don't really change it, but they really expand on it Mm -hmm. in this adaptation. And I wonder if you guys are picking up on the foreshadowing slash what do you think of it as a, as a plot device here? I literally wrote down foreshadowing Lydia in five places in my notes. Yes! Yeah, okay, same. Okay, three places. Yeah. Yeah, it was really heavy-handed, uh, but might not be if you don't know where it's going. Right. It's kind of like it'll be one of those hints that's dropped early on that later you can be like, oh yeah he was talking to her at that party and then she like wanted to dance with him and all of that which I guess it it is a little bit in the book it happens but not in such a way that we see them together when he says and she was 16 your sister Lydia's age and she says Lydia is 15 and there's this moment and I just that's where I wrote down foreshadowing Lydia is, and then all in caps, 15 stops, she is a child. She is a child. Oh, she is a literal child. I I had that same exact thought. I was like, the way Lizzie says that, too, is like, Lydia is 15. Like, stay away. You do not flirt with my sister. So at the party, they start talking about how Bingley is not there. And Lizzie is like, well, I think one of Bingley's friends might have found this gathering beneath them. And Wickham then you can see him very carefully treading around the subject of Darcy and like asking her how well she knows him, trying to gauge like, does she know about me from him? And it could be seen as 
tentative because he doesn't want to talk ill of someone, or it could be seen as tentative because he's an asshole and did something very bad. But this is where he tells her about his whole situation with Darcy and spins it in such a way that he seems like he's the good guy. This is getting into like film nerd territory, but one of the things I noticed for the first time after watching this movie a billion times is how this scene is filmed is so smart. So I wanted to talk a bit about that. They have Lizzie and Wickham sitting relatively close to each other, and every shot is a very close-up shot of one of them. Like, you get really in on both of their faces as they're speaking, which is, like, different than the way they've been filming most of the shots in this film. A lot of the shots are wide shots and capture a lot of different people in the frame, or you get the really close-up shot of just Mr. Darcy, but there are very few frames that are so tightly shot and so have the characters sitting so close together. Yeah. And the cutting back and forth with the tight shot on the face, like, and yeah, it's like, let's convey a lot of emotion right in this moment through dialogue. And that's not something that the film does a whole lot. It's usually giving us a little more distance. Exactly. And it creates an intimacy that isn't there in most of the scenes. And we can see the tears well up in Lizzie's eyes. Yeah. You also get to see how much Lizzie's falling for this. And if you're in on it, like we are, the audience who's read the book, we also get to see how Wickham is trying to decide what to say. We see his eyes shifting. We see him kind of spinning this tale in his mind and Lizzie falling for it. It hurt. It hurts so much. And when she says that Bingley's friend would not have wanted to be here, whatever, he goes, really? Hmm. And like looks and he's like, hmm. And we see that whole moment pass over his face, which was really brilliant what a gross man when he was in the middle of that pile of lies i made some kind of disgusted noise and and kate was like huh and i paused it and just started shouting he is a terrible liar this is terrible let me tell you what he actually did wow wait was kate falling for it too um i don't i don't think so because she's uh clever (laughs) but she didn't know like that everything he was saying was complete nonsense like that he was leaving out basically the important bits is mostly when he started talking about the sister and how she was fond of me once that I just screamed oh I screamed too oh it's so gross yeah yeah I absolutely screamed at that part then he is talking about how she shouldn't feel sorry for him because he's at a really good place in his life right now and Lydia comes over and is like Lizzie why should you not feel sorry for Wickham and then they kind of look at each other like we're not gonna say anything which is such a brilliant move on the part of the film I think Mm. because this is putting Lydia totally in the dark Mm -hmm. and he says oh I haven't had a dance in three months so then she pulls him away and they're dancing and Lizzie's watching and they're like smiling at each other from across the room which really does set up like it's not exactly a love triangle between Lizzie Lydia and Wickham but there is this dichotomy where they switch off wanting to bang him Mm -hmm. and Lizzie gets the intimate conversation but Lydia gets the sexy dance which Doesn't translate as sexy necessarily always when you watch it, but definitely is. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Then we jump to Lizzie telling Jane about all of this that night. And I remember this conversation in the book so clearly. I remember being so irritated at Jane because she said, it's really distressing. One does not know what to think. And Lizzie goes, I beg your pardon. One knows exactly what to think. And I was like, yes, Jane, stop being so kind and start paying attention to the facts but Jane's actually being really smart here and being like we don't know him well enough to believe him yet so I just did a total flip-flop on how I viewed this scene seeing it in the movie reading it in the book yeah it's it's definitely true I also think what's interesting about this scene is that and this is like my study question at the end of this is that Lizzie is much more explicit about having a thing for Wickham like you get her thoughts on it As I said, Lizzie shaved her legs for the ball. (laughs) Uh, But here you basically, she's like, oh, yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely into him. I definitely fancy him. And then Jane's like, "Mm, yeah, but like also he might not be totally truthful about Darcy. You just met him. You can't marry a man you just met. It's a frozen moment, you know? Yep. I was about to say frozen moment because then he turns out to be evil. Yes. Shock. Just like in the movie. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Ladies, if he's charming when you meet him. Make sure he's never um, tried to kill you, anyone around you, or uh, wants to bang your 15-year-old sister. Ew, 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 ew. ew. I do have to say, like, never trust a charming man is a 
pretty good rubric, but also very self defeating for me. So never mind. <laughs> trust the charming ones. <laughs> never trust a charming man. Except me. So this brings us into scene four, where we find out that they've all been invited to a ball at Netherfield, including Collins and Collins is very excited and he wants to dance with all of his cousins and then he he like zones in zones in zooms in zones zooms then he zooms in on lizzie but before he's like particularly i'd like to dance with and then mary is standing in between them and she like looks up so hopefully and she's like and he's like you cousin elizabeth and mary is like oh oh let me hide and she's like just kidding I, I didn't want you to dance with me anyway <laughs> oh poor mary poor mary so that's unfortunate then we see lizzie and wickham and collins walking around the grounds together and collins talking again about that chimney that was 800 pounds and wickham just condescending to him while being very pleasant the whole time it's like wow yes one oh, of yes. you has social skills yep he was like she ha- must be very fond of a big blaze then. And he's like, oh, yes. Also, that I think what is also really done well here is the framing of Wickham and Collins in the shot next to Lizzie. First of all, you see two suitors. Second of all, you cannot help but compare them standing next to her. And one of them is just like charming and in his military regimentals. And the other is human sweat. Big sweat ball. But if you judge them based on that, because we can't stand Collins, but he is exactly what he presents himself as. True. Exactly. And in no way evil. Just gross. Just gross. At least he is honest. Mm -hmm. I hate Wickham so much, but (laughs) I would also be falling for him in this moment. Probably. No, I would be falling for Lizzie. If I was Lizzie, I'd be falling for myself. (laughs) Yeah, unquestionably. Very fair. she's so pretty. None of the men are gay enough for me. Yeah. So this moment was amazing because Jane comes running up and this is very different from how it was in the book but Jane comes up and tells Collins that Mary needs help with a passage in Fordyce's sermons and can he go help her in the library so Jane is playing wingman for Mary on one hand and for Lizzie on the other hand trying to get Collins to leave her and Wickham alone this moment is different from the book because in the book it was something like Collins was telling Lydia that she would be much better suited with a passage in Fordyce's sermons than she would be with a work of fiction. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So the original scene in the book is that after dinner, one of the first nights Collins is there, he reads from the Bible for them for like endless hours. And Lydia basically interrupts him and is like, uh, did you hear this thing Denny did or Colonel Forster did? And then Collins is like really offended and everyone's really embarrassed that Lydia interrupted him. And he's like, you could use some Bible passages because you're a loose woman. And so that's how it sets up here. Instead, what we have is Jane using Fordyce's sermons to come in clutch for two of her sisters. Yes. And I wonder if Mary's actually reading them, too. Probably. Oh, probably. And Jane is just so good, capital G, good, that, I mean, Collins couldn't say no anyway to that request. It would be extremely rude. But also, who could say no to the completely guileless Jane, right? Right. She could have no ulterior motive. She's Jane. It's very good. Right. It's excellent. So she's using that to her advantage here. So then Lizzie and Wickham are walking by themselves, and they're talking about how Bingley is a very good guy, and Wickham is very grateful that he invited all of the soldiers to his ball. And they... Talk about how Darcy could possibly be his friend. Like, how would Bingley be friends with Darcy? And Wickham says that Darcy can be very charming when he intends to be. And that he can fool people in that way. Oh, yeah. Mm. Sounds a lot like someone else that we know, huh? (laughs) Yeah. Basically, the funny thing about it is all of the flaws that Wickham is trying to imprint onto Darcy are Wickham's own flaws. We call that projecting. Yes. (laughs) I was about to say, we call that projecting. Uh Uh-oh, Molly. (laughs) (laughs) it's so weird to be doing this podcast with just two mollies (laughs) i wish everyone could see the face that i'm making (sighs) it's an audio medium i know as graham always reminds us yeah (laughs) then lizzie asks about what sort of person georgie is and this is what you brought up earlier evan and and this is where wickham starts talking about how she used to be very fond of him and how he was so kind to her but now she's too much like darcy i really have to give it to the actor in this moment who plays wickham because 
I think that what he does masterfully right here is he is simultaneously so gently charming as he says these things, but it sends a fucking chill up your spine. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, that's it exactly. If you don't know, I don't know what you'd think. If you do know, you're like, you're a predator. Yeah. Yeah, it just, like, there's something about the way he speaks about Georgiana and Lydia that, like, it's, he doesn't really change his voice. And it's not, it's the lines partially, but the way he says it just really makes your blood run cold. <laughs> it would be kind of fun to get someone who doesn't know what's going to happen on and see what they think of Wickham. Oh, yes. I mean, I was, again, watching it with my boyfriend, and he has not read the books. And he was watching it with me, and he just goes... That's not the whole story. <laughs> this guy's a bad actor. <laughs> Wickham, not the actor. Oh, yeah. You know, the actor yeah, yeah. is actually probably a really nice guy, and he's a very good actor. And then we get the moment where they're looking at Lydia and Kitty being pushed by the officers on a swing, which is very cute. And he says that Georgie is about Lydia's age, 16. And Lizzie says Lydia is 15. And then he looks at Lydia, and he's like, oh. Gross. Yeah, like that made her more interesting to him, not less, because it makes her more vulnerable. Yeah. Ew. Yeah. Gross. Yeah. Ew. So gross. It makes me physically nauseous. Mm -hmm. Then Wickham tells Lizzie that Lady Catherine de Bourgh is Darcy's aunt, which Lizzie nods like she already knows, and that Anne de Bourgh and Darcy are engaged to be married or intended to be married. And Lizzie's like, oh, poor Miss Bingley. And then Wickham like laughs along like he knows what she's talking about, but like neither of them... Like, they're not on the same page here, but anyway. I think we just have to infer that, like, these two have been talking and gossiping a lot about that party. Yeah, that makes sense. And so, like, they know that Miss Bingley is thirsty for Darcy. We know that Darcy and Catherine de Bourgh are related. So, I don't know. I felt like Wickham was bringing up Anne de Bourgh partly to just throw up one more thing between Lizzie and Darcy. Yeah. Just in case. Yeah. Like, don't eat. I mean, I know you won't be interested because I already made you think he's evil, but even if you were interested... Uh, also, he's already engaged, you know? Yeah, it definitely seems like a tactic there to, like, make sure oh, yeah. that they're not a thing. Which is the end of that scene and brings us to our sequence of getting ready for the ball and then the ball at Netherfield. Which seems like as good a time as ever to end this episode of Pod and Prejudice. This is Molly from the future letting you know that we talked for too dang long because we were having such a good time. And now we have another week's worth of material for you covering episode two of the 1995 version of Pride and Prejudice starring Colin Firth and Jennifer Eel. If you want to find Evan on the social medias, their name is Evan Tess Murray pretty much wherever. And if you Google Evan Tess Murray, they're probably the only person that's going to come up. You can follow Needs a Name Pod on Twitter to get updates on their podcast, This Planet Needs a Name, which is so so good i love it it's just a hope punk space tale about sweet gays in outer space so check them out there and until next time stay proper and find yourself someone to talk about jane austen for two hours with Pod and Prejudice is edited by Molly Burdick and audio produced by Graham Cook. Our beautiful show art is designed by Torrance Brown. To learn more about our show and our team, you can check out our website at podandprejudice.com. To keep up with the show, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pod and Prejudice. If you like what you hear, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash podandprejudice to see how you can support us, or just drop us a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.